I wanted just to begin with um, this claim by um, by two authors, two really prominent authors, that um, the diasporic Chinese constitute an ungrounded empire which connects different places into a worldwide business network. So there has been a tendency to see um, this kind of migration not within traditional migration network um, literature, but as um, uh, the, the growth of um, particularly or entrepreneurial migrants, the growth of a sort of transnational um, business network. So we're asking the question, where does the Caribbean fit within this and within newer claims about a transnational ethnic business network and a transnational middleman minority framework? Um, the work of um, the Hungarian anthropologist, I probably have never heard of him, Pal Nairi, um, where he, he's the one pushing this notion of the most recent um, um, outflow, particularly of entrepreneurial migrants from China, um, constituting what he calls a transnational middleman minority. So he's taking the argument about middleman minorities, the domestic argument, and transnationalizing it. Okay, um, you know, we, the jury's still out as to whether this is um, what's going on. But I just wanted to talk very briefly historically about the role of, of Chinese immigrants in the Caribbean. So this is really a second wave of migration, um, and it's under very different circumstances to the first wave. And so the first wave has to do with post-slavery indentured labor, what is known as, and it sounds um, like a very derogatory term, but actually this was a term that was typically used. And historians, um, Chinese historians, non-Chinese historians, continue to use the term to describe what was going on at the time, the coolie system, um, which occurred in the 19th century. And this was um, a system of indentured labor from China, wherever um, European plantations thrived, right? Um, so, for example, indentured labor was used by the Dutch on their Southeast Asian plantations, while the British, which is the um, colonial power we're most concerned with here, employed both Chinese and Indian um, coolies on their West Indian estates after slavery. Um, and if we're looking at the Caribbean, actually, the majority of um, Chinese who came as indentured workers to the Caribbean actually came not to the English-speaking Caribbean, but to Cuba. Um, oh, what am I doing wrong? You doing it wrong? Yeah, oh, okay. Okay, so this is what I was talking about. And, and also, if you go back in terms of the Latin American migration, there was also a huge group that went to um, Peru as well. Um, so let's see, in terms of the Anglophone Caribbean, what was interesting is that the recruitment, transshipment, and labor contracts were controlled actually entirely by British government agencies, which was not the case elsewhere. So just to give you some idea of the numbers of that first migration, around 125,000 went to Cuba. I don't think a lot of people know that um, there was a huge number um, that went to Cuba, more than went to Peru. So Cuba was really the main destination of this so-called coolie migration of the 19th century. Um, 100,000 went to Peru, and really only 18,000, 8% reached the former British West Indies. And what's interesting in terms of our current research is that um, the islands we're looking at did not really take part in that migration. They were much smaller, and so most of that migration went to the larger Anglophone Caribbean islands, Jamaica, Trinidad, and British Guyana, which is now called Guyana, of course. And another interesting thing about this, about that migration, is that um, um, about 96% of the migrants went, I'm sorry, to the Americas came from one province in China, Guangdong, right? So we already have two big differences. Most of them came as, as workers, and secondly, most of them came from a single province. Um, there was another um, sub-wave that came 
um, in the late 19th century, from the 1890s to the 1940s, and that wave was really, um, they were really free migrants, and many of them actually were, um, in a sense, the first, I guess, sort of um, entrepreneurial migrants to the, to the um, region. Um, the island that was most important in terms of the Anglophone Caribbean for that second wave is Jamaica. Um, and there was also, of course, a sort of secondary migration that took place from Guyana to Trinidad and to J Jamaica as well. Okay. Uh, there's, uh, in terms of comparison, um, Christine Ho has written an uh, important article where she looks at, she compares the three islands that were the destination of this first wave and she sees some important differences among the Chinese in Guyana, Trinidad, and Jamaica, but really mostly Jamaica. So the, um, those in Guyana and Trinidad were a, a lot, but quite similar, but because Jamaica was the main destination of that second, that subwave that came as free migrants, um, they were much more independent, much more ethnically um, homogeneous. Um, they were actually Hakka, most of them were Hakka, whereas elsewhere most were Cantonese. So they came, and they also came directly into the retail sector, and they didn't have to share that sector with the Portuguese and, and East Indians as they did, as the other Chinese did in British Guyana and in Trinidad. So in Jamaica you have a more sort of closed, um, business group that is really sort of economically, I think, more coherent and more, I would say, kind of up, upper class, you know, um, sort of almost um, honorary whites to some extent. I just wanted to, to um, I have two quotations coming from um, sort of the co colonial perspective, how the Chinese were seen at the time and how they were seen as, have, as being inserted into the social structure of the Caribbean. Of course, for those who don't know the social structure of the Caribbean at the time would have been, really the, the large masses of the laboring population would have been the um, former African slaves, right? The emancipated Africans, and of course, large numbers of East Indians who came as indentured workers. So the Chinese were seen very much, uh, you know, in terms of um, a sort of comparative, they were looked at comparatively in terms of, um, especially Africans, and of course the whites, uh, the, the, the whites at the very, very top. So um, I'm just interested in um, quotation, Chinese immigrants, this was in 1927, thrive everywhere. They can withstand the hardships of field labor and also the germs that plague the dwellers in a city slum. Their natural field of race expansion, however, seems to lie within the tropics. Here they find fertile countries such as the archipelagos of the Pacific, held by dark races who are naturally agriculturalist, unfitted for life in the town. Um, in, in other words, the dark races who are unfitted for life in the town. Such a country lacks an upper class. This want is first supplied by the whites, who develop the lands and control them, while between the governors and the governed slips in the yellow race, pressing on both strata of society. Um, there's another one, just very quickly, I don't want to take too much time, but I just wanted to get the idea of how they were seen at the time. Unlike their cousins in America, who are mostly engaged in the chop suey and laundry business, the Chinese in the West Indies are engaged in shopkeeping and planting. There are practically no Chinese laborers. In other words, indicating how quickly they left the plantations, right? Much more quickly than other, than other indentured workers. Every Chinese uh, um, aspires to own a shop or plantation. The stigma that China is a nation of shopkeepers is almost true if applied to the West Indies. But under the freedom of British rule, the retail trade, especially in the towns and villages of the West Indies, are predominantly a Chinese monopoly. So despite the fact that the Chinese first came to the Caribbean as indentured workers, they quickly morphed into sort of this notion of a sort of shopkeeper on clay because they left the plantations very, very quickly. Um, and I just want to point out, just remind people, there were two other groups that came as indentured laborers, the Indi East Indians who were much, much more numerous, and Portuguese as well, um, who came in the same capacity. So, oh, just very quickly. Um, I don't think 
so I just, this is, I don't want to spend too much time on this framework we're sort of looking at, but basically it's a framework, the first one, let me see, that has to do with this notion of a transnational middleman minority. And the idea is that this is really, a, as I said, a transnationalized version of the classic middleman minority that um, Edna Bonasek first talked about. But what distinguishes the recent Chinese um, migrants from this classical notion is not just the density of the transnational economic, political, and social ties to China, and I think this is important here, but that these ties are institutionally framed and discursively sanctioned by a well-defined, a strong, unitary nation state, the People's Republic of China. So obviously this is an important difference, right? The fact that now um, there's a way in which, um, in fact, some people talk about Chinese ch or, or transnational Chinese-ness or Chinese transnationalism sort of centered in China, right? Almost like China. Really about, they talk about global China, as if China is at the um, center of these new networks. Whereas, of course, the first wave indicated China's weakness, not China's strength. This wave indicates China's strength, in a way, right? Because it very much depends, um, and I'm talking specifically about entrepreneurial Chinese, their very survival depends on their continued ties to China <coughs> as so, a source of capital, a source of labor, um, and a source of goods, right? And those continue. Um, and Nairin, in particular, talks about um, this new, this new um, transnational middleman minority as going as targeting what you generally call vulnerable countries, you know, transitional economies, um, economies in the global south and also Eastern European countries that are making, have made, are making the transition to capitalism. Um, so in a sense, weak, underdeveloped and tra um, trans transitional capitalist economies. And so let's look at the, very quickly at the Caribbean, I'm really trying to get to, as quickly as possible, to Jan's um, section. There are two forms, of course, this presence we're talking about, um, two <laughs> forms in which it occurs. Um, the Chinese state, right? Um, development assistance, investment training. And it's important to look at these three um, separately because for the tiny islands, they really don't have anything China needs. So really, chi the Chinese state presence is mostly through development assistance. Um, in Jamaica and Trinidad, they're sourcing some um, primary materials, but nothing as big as in Latin America. Like, this is, as you know, um, um, the fact that um, the Chinese demand has slowed down, has had a huge impact on the Brazilian economy. I mean, it has single-handedly been responsible for a slowing down of the Brazilian economy. So this is obviously not the case in our small islands. We're really talking about a much more you know, in a way, people are saying that um, countries like Brazil is almost a new kind of dependency, given the fact that Brazil is a sort of um, almost second, is, uh, is in a, sort of a second tier capitalist economy, is kind of shocking. But in the case of the islands we're talking about, it's really much more dependent in the sense that um, China is coming in as the big development agent. And of course, what we're concerned about is the private entrepreneurial migration itself. So it's important to make a distinction between the Chinese state presence, because after all, the Chinese state presence doesn't occur in the same way in all of the <coughs> islands. And we're going to look at that. And some of the islands continue to have diplomatic relations with Taiwan and not China. But the private entrepreneurial migration stream is going everywhere. So the, most of the new Chinese who are coming into the Caribbean are coming from mainland China, whatever the diplomatic ties. Um, and yeah, so it, it, this development assistance is really transforming <laughs> the landscape of the small islands of the Eastern Caribbean, giving Chin the Chinese focus on large-scale infrastructural projects. That's mostly what they they look at. Um, the the immigrant role in the private sector may seem less dramatic because of the small numbers, but it's really quite transformative as well. But one of the questions in the research is how separate should we keep those two things, right? The Chinese state rule and the Chinese immigrant rule. Um, quickly some background factors. So we talked about the new versus the old migration, the fact that 
this new migration is in some ways quite different, even though it was in a way presaged, you know, almost by the former migration, because towards the end, the Chinese began to occupy much more of a mercantile role. Um, but now they're really coming in as entrepreneurial, bringing their capital and setting up shops. I mean, they're c coming in. I, there is another kind of migration, which is the temporary labor migration on the large scale infrastructural projects. And some of those do stay behind. And from being workers on the Chinese pro um, projects, on the building roads, hospitals, schools, and all that, they're sometimes staying behind and joining the entrepreneurial community, the, the shopkeeper community. Um, so we talked about that. Yes, and then the diplomatic rivalry with Taiwan is interesting. Despite increasing def defections, um, the Caribbean and Central American region still accounts actually for roughly half of Taiwan's remaining diplomatic alliances. So part of Chinese, the Chinese presence is also a, 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 it, you know, a rivalry um, with Taiwan. And in fact, some scholars actually see that as very important for China's attraction to the region because they're saying, well, what is the, it's not getting much in terms of, um, you know, um, raw materials. And so is this diplomatic tie mostly aimed at getting rid of the Taiwanese um, role in the region? Um, so these three islands, no, these islands that have come together, and ultimately, Jan is going to be looking at four islands. Um, they all are islands within the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, and it's a subgrouping of the CARICOM grouping. It's a, that's a grouping of the English-speaking islands into a community, an economic community, not a political community, but a, a strong economic community. For certain um, cla classes of, of workers, for example, they can move freely um, among all of the islands. But this is a subgrouping of the smaller islands, okay, the Windward and Leeward Islands. Um, and what's interesting is that although that subgrouping has even more intense, intensive ties than the larger grouping, these, each island is independent. It's important to understand. Each island is independent and has a place in the United Nations. And within its six islands in the OECS, the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, three of them have diplomatic relations with China, and three of them have <laughs> diplomatic relations with Taiwan. And so of the three islands we've looked at so far, there's Dominica, which has diplomatic relations with um, China, St. Kitts and Nevis with Taiwan, St. Vincent and the Grenadines with, um, with, with Taiwan. But of course, all of the private um, migrant flow is coming from mainland China. Okay. So I just wanted to um, identify the aid coming from the state, um, large-scale infrastructural projects, investment in extractive and agricultural um, industries. So Jamaica and Trinidad and, and Guyana, and of course Cuba, I'm just adding in Cuba here, do provide some of these raw materials. So this is not true about the islands we're looking at, but it's true in, of some of the larger agriculture. <coughs> Caribbeans. Also investment in hotels and other tourism-based industries in the Bahamas and so on. And um, investment in the offshore um, financial centers, which is another thing because it doesn't, these are, this is money flowing through the offshore financial centers that really doesn't constitute an official presence. Uh, I just, let me see. I wanted to shift, so that was that's the role of this of capital coming from, from from China, but the immigrant streams have been identified and um, in in the and differentiated in the African literature, temporary contractual migration, private entrepreneurial migration, and proletarian transit migration. So there is um, going to the huge I mean, continent of Africa. There is this entrepreneurial migration. Um, larger scale capital, of course, um, because of the, the vastness. But there's also an independent proletarian stream. I just wanted to point out that in this small island we're talking about, we really can't talk about an independent um, proletarian um, um, stream. So 
For the, the first two forms are very similar, temporary contractual migration, the, those that are coming on the large scale projects that the state is providing in the Eastern Caribbean, right? They're supposed, they come, they do all of the work. So it causes some tension because they say, why can't locals do employed? But they, they go back. So it's a very temporary thing. Of course, I said some of them stay. And there's a private entrepreneurial migration. Um, in the Caribbean, we really can't talk about an independent transnational ethnic labor market as in um, Africa, since most of the workers are brought in through private arrangements. So it's all privately done. The numbers are much smaller, of course, than in Africa. And there might be a transit or transit element as well, but we don't know whether um, you know, most of them go back to China or go on to third countries, legally or illegally. Um, um, I, at this point, I'm going to let um, Jan take over. Okay. Or do you want me to just introduce her, or can you take over from here? Because I, 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 I want us now to talk about this specific migration to the three islands that we've already done research in. And um, if I think if you hadn't understood the kind of overall um, structure of this migration, it would be hard to understand you know, what are the implications, what's the importance of these tiny little differences among these three little islands. So having said that, I think Ian can um, talk about yeah, yeah. Oh, the, the, the Taiwanese connection, uh -huh. they were immigrants of the Hakka or some other group, it's not Guangdong, is, is in mainland. Yes. But there were, were immigrants from Taiwan, I take it, that predate, uh -huh. predate this diplomatic relationship. Right? So, yeah. no, very few, very few. Uh, yeah, so like um, the larger islands actually switched to China quite early in the 1970s, whereas the smaller islands kept um, in same kids, for example, it's been a 30-something year um, tie with Taiwan. So Taiwan had a stronghold with the smaller islands and started off, of course, it was Taiwan, all of the islands had diplomatic relations with Taiwan and not China. But as they became independent, the larger islands switched to China but the smaller islands, for the most part, part, kept their ties with Taiwan, and then later on began to switch. Now there's been a huge defection to China. Is, yeah. is part of the link, though, maybe in the Small Islands Coalition in the UN? Were relationships built through that, through the years, when that started? I'm not sure. Um, there, there's a coalition that's linked to the UN of the small island nations of the world. I think it goes back to maybe the 1970s or 80s. Uh -huh. And I wondered if relationships with Taiwan, because of these are small islands, were fostered through the UN relationships. It could be. I mean, um, but Taiwan itself is not a, a UN member state, so. Oh, it wasn't part of that coalition? No. Oh, okay. But, yeah, but I mean, it's possible that. Yeah. That, that um, the attraction to Taiwan could have been posted by the by the islands that were part of the UN. But I want yeah. you to take over from me. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Cecilia, for situating uh, this topic in this historical and uh, contemporary context. So, based on uh, our uh, field uh, trips since 2012 to um, the three uh, countries in the Caribbean. I'm going to talk about, uh, I'm going to briefly introduce each of the countries and uh, Chinese immigrants in each of the countries and also some of the features, some of the characteristic, characteristics of Chinese immigrants in these countries. So first, Dominica. So in 2013, the Chinese embassy in Dominica released uh, a post on, C on China's biggest social, social network website saying that there are 142 ethnic Chinese residents uh, and 98 of them are, were Chinese nationals or, or Chinese citizens. And 41 were uh, already, um, uh, 40, 41 became uh, Dominican citizens, and three Taiwanese actually. So um, uh, these uh, Chinese were running 42, 42 shops and enterprises and importing 115 local people. And in St. Kitts and Nevis, uh, we visited that country in 2013, and uh, there are there were about 200 uh, Chinese ethnic Chinese entrepreneurs and workers.
occurs, and we don't know the exact number of, of that, and we don't know how many of these are Chinese citizens, or uh, civilian citizens. So, but we, we know that many of, of the Chinese immigrants there had uh, previous connections with Chinese immigrants in uh, a small island called Saint Martin. So, um, that part we know. And we all know that they have uh, different types so of the, the types of business in Saint Vincent is a bit different from that in uh, Dominica. So there are more larger scale supermarkets and restaurants in Saint Kitts and Nevis. What's the population for Saint Kitts? Saint Kitts and Nevis. Yeah, it's about six, sixty thousand. Sixty thousand. And Dominica is like seventy five thousand. Yeah. So they're they're pretty similar. In that. So you see how the small numbers, you know, make a big impact. And mm -hmm. Vincent and the Grenadines we visited the island uh, in last year. So uh, there are 10 restaurants and 10 variety stores, and roughly uh, 20 uh, Chinese citizens are, uh, and about uh, there are 48, well, this is from the, from the official, official yeah, statistics, so there are, there were 48 um, ethnic Chinese there. Um, so you can see that smaller scale, but there, there are more. Uh, the, the size of the business there are uh, much smaller compared to some of the kids, and probably to Dominica also. So some of the photos, that's a shop in St. Vincent, the same shop. The same store. Yes, it's, <laughs> yeah, like it's, yeah, it looks exactly like dollar store. Okay. And that's a restaurant in Saint Vincent. That's a restaurant. In <laughs> so I'm showing these pictures to, to to show like basically. So in these two countries, Dominica and Saint Vincent, even though they're they one of them is aligned with China and the other is tied with Taiwan, the business look very much the same. So there are a lot of variables that you can consider, but I'm only going to cover basically three topics. So I'm going to talk about the profiles, of the demographic profiles of the entrepreneurs and the laborers. And also I'm going to talk about their places of origin. And I'm going to talk about how they're using their citizenship status flexibly to get around some of the regulations. And I'm going to talk about the impact of the of the diplomatic ties. So first of all, the profiles. So as Cecilia had talked about, there are entrepreneurs and also there are there are workers or laborers. So the entrepreneurs uh, are from different country, different uh, provinces in China. Uh, in some case, most of the immigrants uh, they were still from uh, they're from Guangdong, which is which was a predominantly, so which was the, the premier destination before. And, but in, in Dominica and St. Vincent, it's a different story. So people came from Jiangsu, Guangdong, Fujian, Shandong, so, uh, coast, uh, four of the coastal provinces in China. And the education uh, background uh, is a bit different too. So. Uh, Many of Chinese immigrants in Dominica and Saint Vincent got college degrees, mm. which is quite different from the previous waves of Chinese immigrants, mm. and also from Chinese immigrants in Saint Kitts, who were from Guangdong province. And also their previous uh, occupation. Many of these, uh, many of the immigrants were um, peasants, but some were uh, factory workers and some had their own business in China, some had, mm -hmm. some had uh, run uh, factories, small factories in China. And, and um, Cecilia talked about the, some of the Chinese workers who were employed by the entrepreneurs and later became entrepreneurs themselves. So that's through informal training and, and they, they became um, entrepreneurs. <coughs> and the workers, many of the workers uh, are from the same area, 
with of the of the owners. So they are uh, co-regionalists of owners, but they are also workers from Henan, Sichuan, so some of the inland uh, provinces. And most of the workers right now they are not here to stay. So they are they signed uh, basically three-year contracts or longer contracts with the workers, with the entrepreneurs, and they will go back to China. And so, uh, as we've talked about, there, there are countries aligned with China and countries aligned with Taiwan. So there's a difference in terms of uh, entry control. So take myself as an example. When I was ap applying for a same visa, uh, I got a lot of uh, trouble. So I didn't get it very easily. So, but when I was applying for, uh, well, Dominica doesn't even require uh, a visa for Chinese citizens right now. So you can see that difference. So it's, it's relatively easy for a Chinese citizen to enter Dominica or be employed as a worker. But it's, it's very hard for a Chinese citizen to enter a single site. But St. Kitts is a different story. Even though it is aligned with Taiwan, it is relatively easy to for Chinese for Chinese citizen to get a visa. So that is so that uh, fact alone basically explains that it is not just the uh, diplomatic ties. It is yeah. a characteristic. It is a characteristic of the individual countries. So you cannot say that countries aligned with Taiwan uh, make it very difficult for Chinese citizens to enter. It's, it is not. It is not true. It is basically not true. So. Um, also, I want to talk about the place of initial entry. So Dominica is kind of a hub in that region. So many Chinese came into Dominica first, then they move on to other other islands. After they got uh, the the, China, the Dominica citizenship, they can fr move. They can basically move freely in uh, within that region. So even though it is very hard for a Chinese citizen to start a business in St. Vincent, or I would say rather impossible for Chinese citizen to, to start a business in St. Vincent. It is very easy for Chinese, ethnic Chinese, who got a Dominica citizenship to start business in St. Vincent. So how long does it take to get a Dominic uh, citizenship? It takes uh, five to six years of, uh, that you can get a residency you can get a permanent residency, and then you can apply for the signature. Is it hard for them to get a, a permanent residence in Dominic? It is, is almost it hard? automatic uh, approval of, for the uh, uh, permanent residency after six oh, okay. years of, uh, of five years. Six years. Yeah, five years of residency. Mm -hmm. So it's automatic approval. Mm -hmm. But citizenship is case by case. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering if you could just Quickly say about the economic. Some some people do become citizens by this economic citizenship. Program. Yes, yeah. yes, that's that's a whole new different topic. But yeah. so many of these countries have uh, economic citizenship programs. So basically, you pay a, a, a large amount, about two hundred thousand, up to five hundred thousand U.S. dollars, and you can get a passport. And mm -hmm. some of the Chinese actually got that citizenship through that program. And so, so this go, um, this speaks to the flexible citizenship theory by uh, Ai Wa Wong. Mm -hmm. So this theory basically is saying that some of uh, the international migrants can choose their citizenship based on their economic based on economic reasons. So they are not tied to one particular nation state. They can basically choose their citizenship status. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, this speaks perfectly. This speaks to the Chinese uh, experience in, in this region. So many got citizenship through permanent residency or economic citizenship. Then they can get around some of the strict uh, regulations placed by uh, some countries. Uh, and also, some uh, Chinese uh, immigrants get around these regulations through their kinship network. So even though. Uh, some Chinese citizenship can now start a business, for example, in St. Kitts. They can borrow that certificate from a family member 
who had already been there for a long time. So they can, they can borrow their citizenship status. So they can work, uh, so they own the place actually, but they uh, theoretically, they cannot, but they have their, they have that a business registered under the name of a family member. And also, because it is very hard for a Chinese uh, business to recruit uh, Chinese uh, citizens to work for them in the some Chinese are hiring more local employees. That's mm -hmm. one way of getting around that. You're saying if they have a kinship network, they won't get thrown out of the country? They won't, <coughs> they won't, they won't be pointed at? Because it's got, it's got a, a long-standing business relationship with the neighborhood. I would say that's probably true. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know if I have enough time, but I've t I've talked a little bit about this already. So basically, uh, in these three countries, even though they're Quite similar in terms of what kind of business they're doing. So there, there are supermarkets, variety stores, restaurants, and some small manufacturing. But there's still some differences. So for example, in Saint Lin, in Saint Kitts, the uh, the scale of the Chinese business, the size of Chinese business, is much larger compared to the other two countries, uh, and also uh, the positioning. So the Chinese, for example, the Chinese restaurants in Saint Vincent. Uh, cater mostly to the local employer, to to the local uh, customers, and also they, they are not actually so they're Chinese restaurants. But when you go inside the Chinese restaurant, they're selling actually fried chicken <laughs> and and fried, uh, chow mein and fried rice. That's basically the three the only items well, that they will sell. <laughs> so it's not like a typical Chinese restaurant you, you run into in, in the U.S. Well, in uh, Dominica. Is uh, the Chinese restaurant there are quite similar to Chinese restaurant here in the United States? So they sell uh, a large variety of Chinese dishes. So they're catering to different markets, and also uh, many of the Chinese uh, owners told me actually they're catering to the to, to women. So they're saying that <laughs> women. So they're. they're <laughs> So women are, uh, they have more uh, purchasing power in these countries, I guess. That's what they're, they're what? saying. The purchasing power. Uh -huh. And the reasons. So I wouldn't say that's, that's the, mm -hmm. the, their diplomatic ties with China or Taiwan that has resulted in these differences. I would say it's mostly mm -hmm. the conditions, the market conditions in in these three different countries. So, St. Uh, Kitts, would you say that St. Kitts is, is a little bit wealthier than the two other countries, and thus the, the larger size of Chinese business in St. Kitts? Even though the population of St. Kitts is the smallest, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, St. Kitts, um, I mean, the per capita income is higher than the other two islands, and it has to do with a uh, historical past of, um, it's more what is called the, the straight plantation economies, right, where the entire island was really taken up by pla European plantations. All of them are now wealthier than the islands where they were very, that were very mountainous, so plantations were just in enclaves. And after um, slavery, the end of slavery, there was a, a big, peasant class that emerged. These are much poorer than the strictly plantation economies. Thank you. So quickly concluding the talk, uh, we were trying to compare, uh, we were trying to make two comparisons. First, we were trying to compare the earlier Chinese migrants with the contemporary Chinese migrants into the Caribbean region, not exactly the OECS, because there were no uh, Chinese immigrants, earlier Chinese immigrants into the OECS countries. So, uh, the difference, some of the differences are the current, the contemporary Chinese immigrants, they are tied to a powerful nation state, which is China. So while the previous uh, wave of Chinese immigrants, they were basically on their own. And also, um, the, the contemporary Chinese immigrants, 
uh, are uh, more diverse in terms of their places of origin. So they, can, they come from many different uh, provinces instead of only one uh, Guangdong uh, in, in the case of the previous uh, wave of, of migrants. And also, uh, the contemporary uh, migrants migration is uh, a free migration rather than organized or even though the previous waves of Chinese immigrants were not uh, forced migrants, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that. They were organized of uh, immigration, but not forced migration. And um, also, uh, they are more, they are more um, educated, and they have, they have more uh, financial capital when they arrive. And the second comparison we were trying to make is uh, we were trying to compare these three different uh, countries and uh, we were trying to explore the role of, the, of, the, of China. So I would argue that uh, the, China, the, the existence of uh, diplomatic ties is important for the, for the immigrants. But uh, uh, so you will see that difference uh, in terms of how easy it is for Chinese to start a business, uh, to, to actually ent enter a country and start a business. But this is not a... Um, is so factor. So the Chinese uh, citizens, they can gather around Chinese, ethnic Chinese immigrants. They can gather around some of the uh, difficulties or disadvantages by uh, using their citizenship flexibly. So that concludes our comment.